All right, welcome to technical session number 30. Uh, gentle reminder, we are jumping around in the tea session so that we can kind of marry things up. Uh, we're actually going to be starting our first 10.02 uh, technical session this afternoon. We still have 10.01 to go, but we're getting into the initiation of 10.02 uh, starting this afternoon. Uh, but for the rest of the remainder of this morning, we're going to be kind of going over mobile devices and some common issues you'll come across um, on a pretty regular basis with regards to them. So our main objectives would be to identify many of these common issues that users experience with mobile devices and describe how to likely resolve those common issues. Again, these are going to be your most common, um, as you know, we say quite a lot around here. Usually it's something small. You know, sometimes it's an ID10T error. Um, sometimes it just needs to be restarted. You know, sometimes it's frozen, but in many of these cases, there are relatively quick workarounds. USMs we want to keep in mind while working through these, this particular technical session, the persistence and adaptability. Um, I'm a big fan of persistence because it's one of those things we never succeed the first time every time we try something. If we are succeeding the first time every time we try something, we're not challenging ourselves at all. Sometimes we got to stumble so we know how to pick ourselves up. You know, but in those cases, it's good to have a community around you that will help pick you back up and help keep you motivated pushing forward. And that's what our hope is to build around here. So, Here's a list of some of the common issues we're gonna be going over throughout this particular presentation. We're gonna be talking about some basic display issues. You can't display to external monitors, which obviously uh, coincides more with laptops. Sticking keys, we had mentioned this one earlier. Uh, intermittent or no wireless. Ghost cursor or pointer drift. No power, numlock indicator, and a variety of other ones here that we're gonna be kind of getting into. So first, uh, display issues. Many devices utilize a backlight, especially if you're talking about LCD. Um, if it's an OLED, you do not have a backlight. But if you're dealing with no display at all, and it's a CCFL backlight, you can usually figure this out by the uh, serial number on the laptop and the make and model of it. They'll tell you what type of backlight it utilizes. Um, you check your inverter first, though usually before the inverter goes out, you do have a distinct hissing noise that will kind of let you know that that's about to blow. Uh, if you've ever heard that before, it's kind of one of those things you never forget. It's like when you hear the grinding of a hard drive, the moment you hear that, you never forget that sound again, because that usually means a lot of work for you. Um, so the inverter would be one of your first ones before you would check the actual backlight itself. It could just be a, a bulb out on the CCFL, which you can replace. Or if it's an LED panel, it's gonna be a little bit more intrusive. Uh, dim displays uh, could also be the inverter starting to die. It could be a bulb starting to die. Like if you have multiple bulbs behind it, if you're dim only in one section, it could just mean that that particular bulb is out. Um, or it could be in a singular quadrant if you're talking about an LED backlight. But the simplest, least invasive things to check first is just make sure the brightness isn't turned down on the screen. Because people will do that, especially if like, they come into the office early. <clears throat> office is still dark. The screen is like obscenely bright because their eyes haven't adjusted to it yet. So they turn the brightness way down. And then when everybody comes in, it, the office gets a lot brighter. They can't see their screen, but they forgot they turned it down kind of thing. So always make sure you check your brightness settings before you start doing any invasive procedures like checking, you know, opening it up and looking at the inverter or the backlights or something like that. Because as an IT professional, we want to start with the least invasive method first. Um, one other thing it could be, is maybe there's some obstruction with the, the lid latch. 
and the computer thinks that the lid is still down. So if it thinks the lid is down, it's gonna be dimming or turning off the screen and not allowing it to turn back on. So just make sure you check that as well for dust or debris. It does happen. Flickering. If it's flickering, what kind of backlight are we using? And why? C CCFL. CCFL, very good, why? Because it's dying, either the inverter or the CCFL itself. Okay, but how do we know it's CCFL if it's flickering? Because LED, that does not, um, it doesn't flicker. Very good, very good. That's exactly what I was looking for. LEDs do not flicker. I was going to give it a Greg answer, but uh, I switched up to the Kelly answer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is how it is in real life. Uh, I would have to concede on that one. <clears throat> so yeah, flickering first, make sure cables are not loose, especially if the flickering occurs when you're adjusting the monitor itself, because it could be something, you know, in the hinge where cables are damaged or something along those lines. Um, there's also an issue where it could be a driver to your graphics card is a potential one if your lights are okay. <clears throat> the other thing, if it's got that, those slow bars that are moving up and down the screen, that is a slow refresh rate. It means it's too low. And with this, you would need to turn up the, re, uh, the refresh rate so that you don't see those bars moving through there. <clears throat> if you wanna know what that looks like, take your camera and look at your TV with your camera on your phone and you'll see those bars moving up and down. That's, that's the refresh rate. And that's exactly what it would look like on your monitor if the refresh rate was lower. All right, this one's more for a laptop, but if you're not able to display to an external monitor, obviously the first thing you're gonna check is the hardware. You know, are the cables connected? And as we were, you know, mentioned yesterday, cables have two sides. So we want to make sure both ends of the cable are secure and connected. After that, make sure the devices are compatible. <clears throat> if there's not a compatibility issue, there are a couple of ways to kind of enable the external monitor. Um, check for the Windows documentation because they usually have a key combo that you hit. I think it's like FN and then like F10 or something like that to switch over to an external monitor if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but they'll have like a picture of a monitor usually on the keyboard to kind of indicate what it is. Uh, make sure you can toggle through it because it might be use that monitor only, use your monitor only or use both. So those may be the options as you're toggling through on the, uh, Function keys. <clears throat> also, you could possibly press the Windows button and the P key brings up a dialog box and it'll let you choose which display should appear. There's also a counter to this is if somebody was giving a presentation and then they come back to their office and they don't have a, they don't have a picture anymore, they didn't toggle it back to their screen before they left the presentation. This happens all the time. So you would go in and just hit the function keys and toggle the monitor back to the main display. And that usually will resolve that issue. So that would be the other side of this coin. Questions so far? Right. Sticking keys, don't eat at your desk. It's so convenient and it's more I, uh, I know. I, I did that when I, you know, when I first started working, I did that. And then I realized after a short period of time, I didn't even want to use my keyboard. So, you know, I switched it out, stopped eating at my desk, and it was it was a much happier, happier times. Um typically doesn't occur with mobile keyboards as much because there, there is a tighter enclosure around the keys. 
but with standard keyboards <clears throat> that are a little more open, they are a little bit more vulnerable to collect dust, debris, spilled liquids. I really hope not, but that does happen. <clears throat> Aside from cleaning the keyboard, uh, the mechanical parts, mechanical parts can also wear out with overuse, which would need them to be replaced over time. For mobile device, keyboards are typically built in. So when a mobile device is having issues, there are only two issues you have, you can, or only two ways you can resolve this. There's the quick way and the way that takes forever. The quick way is just hand them an external keyboard and say, here, plug this in for now. And then they can plug that in, can keep working for their day. And then once they have time or, you know, their shift is over or something like that, you can come to the resolution of whether or not you want to replace the keyboard or replace the whole device. Depending on the inventory you have, will kind of determine your you know, path forward. You may switch them over to a new device and then repair the keyboard as you have time. But again, it depends on your availability, if the company wants to do something like that, and also the type of device, because some of them it's just the keyboard is one of the first things you remove. It's easy, swap it out, no big deal. Other devices, you have to remove everything from inside it to get to the keyboard, and it takes a lot of time, and they may not want you to do that. All right. Intermittent or no wireless. If it's intermittent, it's usually a signal issue, and it means you're probably not close enough. So something's either between you and the antenna, or you're too far from the antenna. So if you're using a mobile device, thankfully you're mobile, and you can move to a better location and try to get into better position to receive a signal from the wireless antenna. Uh, some things you need to pay attention to, older Wi-Fi systems operate off the 2.4 gigahertz band. There are things that interfere with that quite easily, like microwaves and wireless phones. Not mobile phones, old school wireless phones, because they operate off that same bandwidth. Um, so you may run across instances where people think, oh, my wireless is perfectly fine. Then sometime around the middle of the day, all of a sudden my, my internet keeps dropping. And then you figure out that the antenna is, or the break room for lunch is in between them and the antenna. So every time they turn on the microwave, it's killing their signal. So around lunchtime, this can hurt, this can occur. So the 2.4 gigahertz band is vulnerable to microwaves, and wireless phones. <clears throat> yes, you, you do wanna be aware of that and know that one. Other thing, yes, Greg. I just had a question about um, Bluetooth because um, now that I know that it's, it's in the 2.4, um, the same, range. yeah, gigahertz range, wouldn't that be a part of the interference? You might think, but remember when he was talking about Bluetooth, part of the beauty of that technology is it does a bunch of micro hops between bands in order to transmit the data so that it actually poses minimal interference along that bandwidth. Mm -hmm. So it's constantly shifting its uh, channel that it's operating on mm -hmm. so that it's finding that least um, busy channel to operate on. Because oh, we're just talking about the bandwidth here but we also can get into channels on top of that. And when you're talking about wireless phones and uh, microwaves, they're often, they're buzzing almost across the entire bandwidth, mm -hmm. especially microwaves. It's not isolated to specific channels. I remember the older phones, I think you had like three options on channels sometimes, or the old wireless ones, you could be on channel one, channel two, channel three. Yeah, then they get to 11 and it kept going up. Yeah, I think we're up to 12 on 2.4. Mm -hmm. 12, something like that, 12 or 13. I don't know. We'll get to it. Okay. Always remember 1, 6, and 11. Um, but we'll talk about that when we get to Soho Routers. Um, one other thing you need to pay attention to is the number of devices that are on a wireless network. Most wireless routers can only handle so many devices. And if all of them are trying to talk, it slows things down. Um, contrary to popular belief on wireless networks, all devices aren't talking at the same time. Only one device can talk at a time on a wireless network. 
The others have to wait until they're done and then they can talk. So you're alternating between multiple devices. The more devices you add to that network, the more it slows it down. Until <clears throat> Mimo, right? Even with Mimo, yeah. But Mimo is you're talking about multiple bandwidths too. So you're talking about 2.4 and five on the mm. same channel or on the true, same true, true. device. Thank so, you. do what? I was just saying thank you, sorry. Mm -hmm. No problem. Um, also, uh, yes, both or not. If you're talking, you're muted, I can't hear you. Um, yeah, I had a problem this morning. Mm -hmm. um, my phone Wi-Fi works good, but my laptop Wi-Fi is, I don't know, I don't know what's wrong. I had to, um, I had to use my phone's um, hotspot for the laptop. The Wi-Fi is on, but then I don't know what's wrong. I, I, you know, I was saying it this morning, DR, that, that DW that was having problem. It was just, I was, it was kicking me out. I don't know why. Kept kicking you out? Yes. The Wi-Fi just kept going off and on. And the one on the phone was stable. I had to use the hotspot on the phone to connect yeah, to the Well, Wi was it the cell signal was good on the phone or was the Wi-Fi signal good on the phone? The Wi-Fi. Okay. So the Wi-Fi was good on the phone and this is in the same area? Yes. Okay. They also could be operating off of different channels. Like your phone may be operating off of 2.4 and you may be trying to operate the laptop off five. And that might be where the problem is coming in because five does not travel through walls as good as 2.4. So your phone will be able to pick up the signal easier than your laptop would. So you might want to check in your Wi-Fi settings on your laptop and see what channel you're trying to operate on. Okay. I'll do that. If it's on five, try to switch it to four. It'll give you a better range in the house. Okay, thank you. No problem. All right, so limit the number of devices, check your location. Are there anything in between you and that device, like a, like a microwave, wireless, or wireless phone, something like that, that, <coughs> that might be interfering? <coughs> Try to limit that as much as you can. And then we'll get down to wireless antennas in the laptop lid. Make sure it is seated correctly. This would be an invasive procedure. You would have to open it up to make sure that it's seated. And this is for intermittent, not no wireless. No wireless, this would not be one of your first options. You would go to making sure that the wireless was turned on. Maybe airplane mode was turned on, something along those lines before you would get to, okay, let's pull out our screwdrivers and crack this case open. So. That is one thing you would check as well. Also check your band, you know, which, you know, megahertz you're operating on because <clears throat> some have better range. Five is really good if you're closer, but it's more subject to interference with walls and things like that. So it's not as good at passing through walls. All right. No wireless at all. Typically, that is wireless has been disabled or the antenna itself is not functioning. So you want to make sure first check your wireless button, make sure it's on, make sure airplane mode is not off. You know, verify this. If that's the case, then you would probably open the lid, make sure that your wires are connected. <clears throat> and there's been no break in the wires that usually happens, unfortunately, in the hinge of the laptop is usually where that wire break is going to occur. Questions, comments. All right. Ghost cursor or pointer drift. Ghost cursor would be like you're seeing double cursors, and this can be caused by a faulty trackpad. If it's getting overheated or something like that, it's not going to be able to um, represent where you're touching it accurately so it may end up showing dual cursors or a ghost cursor um, if this is the case set the laptop to hibernate or sleep when the lid closes this may prevent the ghost cursor since the device is not going to be on all that time and unfortunately 
many of these devices also vent through the keyboard <clears throat> if the lid is closed. Um, it can't ventilate properly. So that's where that comes in. Other thing, update the drivers for the trackpad. It happens from time to time. You want to regularly check your drivers on most of your peripherals just to make sure they're operating properly and they're up to date. None of these solve. You can disable the touchpad altogether and use an external mouse or the pointer stick or trackball that is in the middle of your keyboard if your keyboard comes with that. Pointer drift. This is when, I don't know if any of you have experienced this, usually it happens with those darn pointer sticks. This always happens to me if I use those pointer sticks. After like a few weeks, you'll stop touching it, but the pointer just kind of continues to move on its own little path, going where it wants to go. Um, if that's the case, you need to recalibrate uh, your settings on your mouser, on your mouser, huh? words are hard, the mouse, <clears throat> and um, update its sensitivity. Sometimes it can be user issue. Um, some people may call you and say, hey, my, my cursor keeps jumping all over the screen. I'm trying to type in one section of the document, but it's jumping to a different page. It's jumping up on the page or all over the place. Unfortunately, this is user error and it comes from poor technique in typing because what's happening is they have the trackpad at the base of their keyboard. And when they're typing on their keyboard on laptops, they're resting their palms on that trackpad and it's lightly touching the trackpad, causing it to jump around. Quick solution to this is to disable the trackpad. Not always conducive to have a conversation, you know, like, well, if you had better typing technique, this wouldn't be happening. Um, they I'm usually don't. You're calling me a, a bad typer out there. I, I resemble that remark. Um, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm guilty of it. And uh, so I'm trying to get better. So I'm working on my typing techniques. See if I, I can get better. To work on. Typing is not you what? Too many things to work on. Typing is not at the top of the list. Uh, yeah, I know that list is pretty long. I'm talking about my list. My list is huge. <laughs> in, the, in, in IT, the more you learn, the more questions you have, and the more you realize you need to learn. That's the uh, unfortunate thing. So user issue could be one of those things as well as we talked about and that's a question that may come up if the cursor is jumping all over the screen it's usually them resting their palms on the trackpad as they're typing and that's causing the cursor to jump around no power so the device runs on power when ac or when there's no hour ah. Devices run battery when there's no AC power running between the outlet and the computer. The device is plugged in or it's running on battery power. First things first, make sure there's power coming from that outlet because you'd be surprised at how many times it's just a breaker or a bad outlet. Sometimes a breaker blows like, my house is very weird how the breakers are. Most places set up their breakers by room, but the people who built our house thought it would be really fun to make the breakers by wall. So in each room, you have four breakers for every room and some breakers work in multiple rooms. So if you blow the breaker because they're doing something in another room that's attached to that same outlet, that breaker could blow, but you wouldn't lose anything else. So simple check, pull the plug, plug it in in a different outlet. If you start getting power, either it's a breaker or a bad outlet. Happens and it's a simple, easy check. <laughs> I think whoever built your house must have built mine as well. Right. Well, what I think it was, was they, they quite literally, they sat down and they calculated it out. What is the minimum amount of wiring we could use to, to run this house? And they, they really worked on this because like my entire master bedroom is, is like that part of the house is wired through the light in the guest bathroom. I don't know why, but all the power goes into that light and then into the other rooms. <laughs> They hop it through. It's weird. <laughs> um, so next thing, check the power adapter, the lights on the, on the actual adapter itself. Many uh, power adapters on your cable 
have a little light on it and they'll have an indicator on it when it's plugged in. It'll be green, you're basically signifying, yeah, it's got power and that power is being transferred through. So make sure you check that, check on your device, make sure you're getting that little lightning bolt in there so that it knows it's receiving AC power versus running off of battery. I think your phones do that as well, where it shows a battery. And then if you have it plugged in, it has a little lightning bolt in the battery telling you that it's plugged in at that point. If no lights may appear and you know the outlet's good, like if you plug something else in there and it works fine, you may have a bad power adapter. Happens. Just like, you know, power supplies. Happens. Um, if the power adapter lights come on, but you're still not showing it on your device, it could be that the power port on your device is bad. In which case, I hope it's still under warranty. Also, sometimes we may not notice it if we jostle our computers, the power cord can become partially dislodged. So you're not getting a solid connection. So it's not charging. It's not registering that it is secure. I don't know if any of you ever had this happen with your phone where you, you plug it in when you're in a hurry, but you don't realize you don't get it all the way in and it doesn't actually charge. You come back a few hours later and you're still on 2%. You're like, oh, you know, so you're not getting that full charge. So you got to make sure that your connections are complete. So that happens as well. And obviously, before you go out and buy a new adapter, try plugging it into another outlet or trying another adapter and see if that solves your problem as part of the troubleshooting process. If you're, a, a, <clears throat> if you're in an enterprise environment, they're likely using multiples of the same type of equipment. I know at my old office, we quite literally had a filing cabinet full of power adapters. So, you know, if you wanted to try when you quite literally just went in and grabbed another one of the same type, went, tried it, make sure it was good. I think it was Dell has that nice blue ring around the power adapter well or on the, the connector piece that also lets you know that it's fully powered. Any questions, comments, concerns? this point other tips i'm open to that all right here we go um num lock indicator lights typically this is on when the num lock is enabled Hopefully, you know, you just toggle it on and off, make sure it works. Um, sometimes you need to initiate the function keys in order to turn NumLock on and off when they do not have a separate trackpad. Um, I know mine doesn't have that. I don't know if anybody else does where you, where you have like a, you actually have to toggle to use the number keys in the middle of your keyboard versus having that separate number pad or the 10 key off to the side. Um, I unfortunately don't have that option. I just have the fun strip across the top that I have to use. All right, questions, comments, concerns? All right, no Bluetooth connectivity. As we learned yesterday, Bluetooth is Radio, radio waves operating off of that 2.4 gigahertz bandwidth. <clears throat> and it syncs with devices with the technology that it calls pairing. And it is a wireless short range communications technology standard. Always remember Bluetooth has a button that allows you to enable and disable it. I usually recommend have it off unless you're actively using it. First, check and make sure that Bluetooth is enabled if you're having difficulty pairing your device. <clears throat> On Windows machines, that usually is a function key. And then the Bluetooth icon, you can also do it in your settings. I know on Mac OS, they actually have the icon up in the corner and then you can click it and toggle it on and off from that point. This would be on a Windows device. <clears throat> so if this doesn't work, 
Unfortunately, like if toggling on and off, if your device is able to pair with other devices, just not with this one, and no other Bluetooth device can pair with this one, you want to try other devices if possible, then unfortunately you may be down to replacing the Bluetooth antenna within the device. Questions, comments, concerns, complaints, revelations, extra tips. I'm always open to that. I really am. I ran into that issue um, and it, I actually had to update the Bluetooth driver for the here. device. But the thing was, was you were you not able to connect to any devices or was it just the one device you were trying to hook up to? No, I just couldn't connect to anything. Uh, I couldn't connect to anything at all. So I had okay. to update the driver to that. But it was a it's a miss. It was a miss because I updated the operating system, and the mm -hmm. default didn't quite work. That happens, unfortunately. If ever you do a big update and then you have stuff not working at that point, it's usually something in the update that caused it, unfortunately. Yeah. But we do talk about that quite a bit. All right. So check your drivers too. Like let's add that to the list. So before you crack the case, check your drivers first. Make sure they're up to date. All right, touch screen issues. What are our two types of touch screens? Resistive and resistive um, and capit. I was going to say capitative. Yeah, capitative. <laughs> the hand <laughs> touch screen. Um, it's capacitive. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so. Resistive and capacitive. Um, which one is the newer technology that we would use on our touch screens? Capacitive. capacitive. <laughs> nice. All right. So tablets, smartphones, and most other handhold handhelds at this time use capacitive touch. And it is, they have, um, technologies that have touch flow and multi-touch technology, which has kind of added a whole lot of functionality to that trackpad where it used to be just moving the little cursor around. Now we can do all kinds of stuff, zoom in, zoom out, you know, tracking left and right, scrolling up and down. I mean, there's all kind of closing applications really quickly with just brief gestures of our hands. So really, really improved the uh, functionality of the device. And, you know, simply because it is allowed or it recognizes multiple connection points on the device. Touch and flow or touch flow uh, designed by HTC allows a finger drag up, down, left and right to scroll the screens. Uh, Multi-touch, it's usually two fingers on the touchpad scrolling up, down, left and right to scroll. So if the touch screen becomes responsive at this point, we want to first try restarting the device because usually that corrects a lot of problems and it will automatically do a recalibration of the capacitive. So it, it does it every time you restart. Um, something could be conflicting with the, the technology. Um, so this usually will clear those issues out. Check your screen for cracks and uh, make sure the device has not gotten wet because that can also interfere with its ability to register your touch on the screen. If you have wet fingers, um, that can also do it. <clears throat> I know none of us here have ever dropped our phones. We take very, very good care of those things and have never cracked our screens. So when you deal with a customer and only half of their touch screen works and there's a big old crack running across of it, that may be the cause of their problem. So just one of those things that we can inform upon once we see it. I know none of us have ever done that kind of stuff. I had a, um, I have a friend, she, uh, she's in a wheelchair and she has a little pouch that sits just behind her feet. And she always misses that pouch when she's putting her phone in it. That poor woman runs over more phones a year. You know, I think she goes through like six phones a year or something like that. I think it got to the point with Apple where they refused to insure her phones because she was breaking them so often. All 
All right, apps not loading. Uh, typically we get these through the App Store, Google Play for the most part. Uh, even if the app is free, it's still considered a purchase in parentheses or in, in quotes. And after the purchase, the app is downloaded to install to the device. <clears throat> You want to make sure if it's your first time opening, it's not opening up. It may have been a failed download where it got most of the stuff there, but not quite all of it enough to get it going. So it may not have finished downloading, tried deleting it, reinstalling it, and oftentimes that can correct it. Um, so you first want to check and make sure that it actually successfully downloaded. Because um, if it's not downloaded, obviously it will not install or load as you wish. If it has been fully downloaded, you know it's there, you've tried it before, now all of a sudden it's not working, um, you can restart the device. If it's if the app itself is frozen, you can do a, a task kill or, or you know kill the app by shutting it down manually and then restarting it and that restarting the app itself, that can kick it up. Sometimes restarting the device will help because it's clearing out all the memory, allowing it to you know free up some space for it to operate. If that still doesn't work, try uninstalling and reinstalling the application, and that may help as well. <coughs> some issues that we have become very aware of, applications run in the background. Some apps use a ton of data, a ton. And even when we think they're closed, they're still using data in the background. So you can go into your settings and you can restrict individual apps to only run on Wi-Fi data if you do not want them using your cellular data. And here's another fun thing with you, uh, authorizing applications for location tracking and all that stuff. You know that, that fun little option where it says only allow tracking when the application is open? That doesn't mean when you're looking at the application, I mean, when the application is running. So it may be running in the background. So you know periodically throughout you know, the day or a couple of times a week, you, you go and you start closing out all those applications. Well, every single one of those applications that you had to close out was still utilizing location tracking services that entire time because they were technically considered to be open. So just to be aware of it. Yes, running in the background. Slow performance. When performance slows over time, your performance can be freed up by, you know, by freeing up your RAM space, essentially. So if you start out really good and then throughout the day, things get slower and slower and slower, be this on your computer, your laptop, your you know, tablet, phone, whatever, you know, what have you. Um, you can make sure to check if you don't have applications running in the background, you can close them down. <clears throat> you may also, unfortunately, have a virus or malware running on your system if it's running exceptionally slow because the viruses or malware will start chewing up resources, things like that. Um, if you have a mechanical hard drive, defragmenting the hard drive is a good step because it takes all the, the stuff on your computer and puts them in what's called contiguous clusters, which basically means everything that is alike gets put together. So all of you know, if you have a movie on there, it'll take all the bits of that movie and put it all in one place rather than having that movie scattered across 20 or 30 different locations because that was the only free space it had. So, but this is specifically for mechanical hard drives. Other thing, your system may need to be updated um, <clears throat> so that it can get updated performance and updated applications, updated security, all that kind of fun stuff. If your system isn't updated, but the applications are, they can slow things down, unfortunately. Um, one of the other things we talked about was like, as we download certain applications for our convenience, they go ahead and start up all of these applications whenever we start our computers so that they can be up and ready for us just in case we want them. But, 
some of these programs we may only use once a month, once a quarter. Like, do we need TurboTax booting up for us every single day if we only use it once or twice a year? No. So it has no business being in our startup menu. So we can go into MS config and disable programs that are starting up as our computer starts up. Again, my main recommendation is, is if you do not recognize what a program is, please be sure to do some research and look it up, Google it, figure out what that program is before you disable it. Because you could be shutting, you know, stopping uh, important systems from running. Uh, for smartphones, make sure you're stopping all your background applications. Make sure your, your applications and your systems are up to date. And turning off background services that always run, including Google Maps, Google Drive, you know, Google, Google loves to always be running. So any of these background applications, you know, that are constantly going to be going on your system, make sure you shut them down. And that could free up space and give you a lot better performance out of your phone. Questions, comments, concerns? Doing pretty good on time. Yep. Freezing. I love the meme. How come every time my computer get hot, gets hot, it freezes? <clears throat> So many of the same reasons that a system may lock up or freeze are the same that you would get for slow performance. It just hasn't reached the level of freezing yet. It's just slowing things down, but hasn't quite escalated to that freezing level yet. <clears throat> so... Look at say, the same reasons we had, run antivirus, defragmenting hard drives if you have a mechanical drive, shutting down background applications, all that kind of fun stuff if you're having freezing issues. Um, if the device is completely frozen or uh, you know, unresponsive, you have to do what is called a hard boot on the system. That's where you press and hold that power button for five seconds while it's still on, and it just shuts it down. And then you're able to boot back up, and then you get some functionality out of it. <clears throat> This will clear the memory cache as well as clearing all your temporary files. If the device is frozen while texting, enable airplane mode, then disable it. And this can force the device to reestablish a connection and allow you to continue communicating. So that is another way you can go about doing it. One that they don't get into here, but we'll talk about during um, our security portion is some people believe that if they download one anti-malware program, that's awesome. But if they don't load two, it's even better. If you run two antivirus software at the same time on your system, that is catastrophic because the antivirus programs or anti-malware programs will view the other program as a virus and they actually start fighting for resources. So you can quite literally bring a system to a bear crawl, if not crash it, if you have two um, antivirus programs running at the same time. So please keep that in mind as well. All right. Questions, comments, concerns. That one's a big one. Which that was one? a big one. That one, the last bit you just did, um, in terms of running two antivirus at the same time. That's what we were talking about yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, with Hitman Pro and other stuff. Yeah, running. Yeah. Yep. Experienced that a lot. Oh yeah, it'll 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 lock up the system quick. Yeah, um, when, when, my, when you, my mother did that and then brought the laptop to me. She's like, I don't know what's going on here. And because it was locking up so quickly, it was taking me like multiple restarts just to get anything done. It was mm -hmm. hours of work to undo that that one mistake. And uh, a lot of um, corp. Uh, so if you go to a corporate uh, you know, corporate environment, you, know, you would like Norton. And then, you know, for uh, 
particular issue, they'll run something else, but they didn't mm -hmm. disable the other one. And yep. it's just, it's a pain. Yeah. And then it just, it just drags the system fast. Yeah. But yeah, that's a, that is a really big one. And it, and it's a common one too. People, and then people yeah. think, Oh, the virus got me like, no, it was two, two antiviruses. Yeah. That's, that's what I mean. Yeah. It's a, it's a very common one is what I mean by big. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah. That is extremely common. All right. New one. Unable to decrypt email. Sometimes on a mobile device, viewing encrypted emails can be a challenge because at times the mobile device cannot locate the certificate and the corresponding key to decrypt the message. And as we mentioned yesterday briefly, it's kind of out of scope for the course, but just kind of to be aware, certificates are just kind of like, you know, like you getting your A plus certificate, you know, basically lets people know that you, you know, have a foundational knowledge within IT. The certificate on the computer basically says this computer is trusted and authorized in order to perform this function. So similar premise. <clears throat> so one way to get around this is you only view the email within the app of the email provider, such as Gmail or Yahoo. They have their own third party apps rather than viewing it through the um, generic email service that you would get on your phone. Um, you can utilize a smart card with a key that is needed to decrypt emails. That would be another option. And then also make sure SMIME is enabled on your mobile device and that is checked. Because SMIME is for encrypting and decrypting emails. Questions so far? All right. Overheating. <clears throat> this can happen if your vents are being blocked. On mobile devices, this happens without us even realizing it. We have vents on the bottom of our device. And uh, more often than not, they get filled with pocket lint. You know, dust, debris, pieces of fabric, you know, that build up in our pockets. We keep putting these things in our pockets and taking them out. Over time, they become clogged dust, dirt, debris, the phone itself cannot ventilate properly, begins to start overheating. Any of us ever got the angry thermometer on our phone, basically telling us, you know, like, you know, you shall not pass until I get, you know, cooler weather. <clears throat> but um, with that, you know, how do we handle that situation? One, in the moment, remove the case from your phone. Do not put it in direct sunlight. Uh, you can put it somewhere where it can cool off, like on a flat, cool surface or something like that. Do not put it in the freezer. <laughs> I, I have seen people do that. Um, but yeah, just a normal flat, cool surface. Let it cool down. Take it outside the case. It can breathe a little bit better. It can, you know... You know, get rid of that heat, almost like a heat sink. The metal case can help disperse that heat a little bit better. <clears throat> Never block the vents if at all possible. Laptops, make sure it's on a flat hard surface. We don't put them on blankets. We don't put them on towels. We don't put them on our lap. We don't put them on our bed. Flat hard surface. And some of you, I know we're doing this right now. And it's, it's frustrating because I want to say, like, stop. <laughs> You're killing your laptop. But keep it on a flat, hard surface so that the vents are clear. It can continue to ventilate. And, you know, as well on laptops, remember they vent through the, the keyboard as well. Um, occasionally clean these things out. Make sure like, you know, little dust bunnies aren't accruing in the vents, all that kind of fun stuff. You can use compressed air to blow out your keyboards. They do make specialized vacuums that do not allow for ESD. Don't use a shop vac on your vacuum or on your computer. That's bad. Um, if you do, please film it for YouTube. Um, 
But uh, the other one is reduce the device, you reduce the use of the device while charging because it's, you know, you have the electrical current coming in charging it, and then you're utilizing the device at that same time, increasing the electrical circulation, which leads to higher temperatures. So minimize your use while charging. All right. Questions, comments, concerns so far? All right. Oh, wow. Okay. Let's see here. No sound from the speakers. Speakers not producing any sound whatsoever. Make sure First, it's not muted. Make sure it's not muted. Make sure the volume is turned up. One thing they don't have here is make sure it's not paired to another device like Bluetooth headphones. To me too. I'm you like, I'm not, I'm not listening to Spotify. Meanwhile, it's paired to my laptop. Yeah. So make sure it's not paired with another device. So it's sending it sound somewhere else. You're like, I got the volume all the way up. Mute's not on. What the heck's going on here? Meanwhile, your headphones are jamming out on the counter behind you and you don't even realize it. So check sound on another application. It may just be that app. I don't know if you guys noticed, but... You can turn down Zoom specifically. So in your uh, preferences in Zoom, you can go to your audio options and just turn down Zoom. So if I'm overly loud and obnoxious, you can bring me down to a manageable level. If you got a, if you have a Windows uh, laptop, you can also go into your sound mixer and select all the various different applications running and adjust your sounds through there. Exactly. And or, yeah, and if, and and if no one's saying- sound can do the, the same thing. What was that, what were you gonna say? Yes, but I was also saying like, if for instance, like some of you guys, I have a hard time hearing just because my hearing isn't the best. I'm able to turn up Zoom specifically and not blow my ears out on other stuff. So make sure you check those individual applications or check other applications just to see if other things are working and not just that. They're very so restart the device just to see if that clears up any problems you may be having. Check for updates on your sound card drivers to make sure <clears throat> you're good to go or your integrated sound already on your, on your motherboard. And then last... After backing up the device completely, try system reset to restore to factory settings and then you can re-upload all your applications. But make sure you do your backup first. And if you're one of those people that stores a backup on your computer, please make sure you remember the password to get that because <laughs> those are usually password protected. Because uh, we had a uh, big issue with that one here. We couldn't get a phone re, re, uh, rebooted because someone didn't remember their password. I'm not going to name names because she would get upset. I just watched a video about the, <laughs> about a guy about this man who lost the key to his crypto wallet. That had oh, dude, mm -mm. <laughs> and he and he got Kingpin, who was one of like the most notorious hackers in the '90s and 2000s. He got him to hack, to basically hack this physical device that was his wallet. Oh and yeah, he, I remember you talking about this. That's really in order, yeah. In, in order to get that money that was in there, and it it took like months of planning. They had to go to, they had to take it to him. It, it was it was pretty intense. It was, Really good. I imagine it was that like you only get one shot at that. Yeah, he only got one shot. Yeah, yeah, it was one shot. That's it's it. like it's either this is going to work or it's lost forever. Right, but at that point he was out of options because he he's got two million dollars that he can't access. Yeah. He, 
Right. Like he had, he already, I think you get a certain amount of tries before it completely wipes the data. And he was down to the last try. On the older hardware wallets, it would depend. Um, Cause I knew there was a guy like in Cal, there was a guy in California who had like, I think he had like $15 million on there or something like that in, in BTC. And he was down to like his last two tries on his password or something like that. <laughs> That's not as bad as the guy with like half a billion dollars that threw in the trash. Oh, in Europe. He, yeah, on his hard drives, he got rid of his hard drives. Oh my god! Yeah, he threw it. He threw it away. And here's the they they now allowed him to go try to excavate because before they weren't even letting him go look. Now they're letting him go excavate. So he's digging, trying to find that hard drive. Well, I'm sure he could outsource some of it, right? He could like have a like a little small company going with an excavate. Uh, yeah, right. You know, when we find it, you get X, X percentage of it. So exactly, yeah. it, it'll be worthwhile. It's you know some garbage digging that's worthwhile. If they yeah, find. no kidding. <laughs> Half a billion dollars, guy threw in the trash. All right, GPS not functioning. It actually, sounds kind of like a dream. Um, so your location services do not appear even after restart. And the, if you know, if you want to know if location services, if you're being tracked, I'm not sure about on an Apple device or on an Android, but on an Apple device, there's a little arrow that shows up in the top of your screen. If that arrow is there, you're being tracked at that moment by one of your applications. If that arrow is on all the time, I suggest you read 1984. Great book, great book. <laughs> so, well, a great one. <laughs> first, make sure location services are enabled on your phone if you're not able to, if they're not working for you before trying any other solution. So, first, make sure that's enabled. And then check to ensure the device has either cellular or a Wi Fi connection because sometimes it requires cellular enabled Wi Fi or GPS where it uses the cell towers to kind of help. We talked about that yesterday, I believe. Be sure you are not covering the antenna because uh, contrary to popular belief, signals don't travel through us very well. Um, and then also, Windshields have UV, UV protection, like some, some types of tinting on windows can actually interfere with GPS signals. So that may be an issue as well. So check it outside the car versus in the, inside the car to see if it's some of the window tinting that you've had, that you have, if that is interfering as well. Questions so, so far? Put it into a Faraday bag. <laughs> I got so mad because like uh, Comcast wouldn't let me turn off the the Wi-Fi for everybody, you know, because they allow every, you know, you can log into Comcast, which basically means you're using everybody's Wi-Fi. They don't allow an option for me to turn that off. I actually built a Faraday cage and put it around my uh, my uh, Comcast router. It's like okay, fine. <laughs> I'll just use my own wireless router. Yeah, Optimum does the same thing. It's like they're, uh, that's how they, they advertise. They have millions of hotspots everywhere. That's because it's everyone's home router. Mm -hmm. so, so you can't did, stop. <laughs> did you hear how Amazon is going to help you with your with Wi-Fi? No. Oh, anybody here have Ring devices? No. Internet of Things, you know, stuff like that, that you might have purchased from Amazon. Well, they're building code into that because they want to help the world with the Wi-Fi problem. So much like Comcast or Optimum was sharing your Wi-Fi with other people, Amazon plans to do that using your Internet of Things, like your ring, uh, cameras and all that stuff to kind of help share your Wi-Fi with other people as well. I don't see how that could cause any problems at all. And I thoroughly trust my tech overlords. So that's interesting because they they bought a wireless, um, like you know, 
router company like a couple of years ago, Eero. Mm -hmm. um, Eero, which I loved. It was like really, really, really nice um, mesh router system and they went yep. and bought them. So yep. that's interesting. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's similar to technology, kind of like they use on cruise ships. Like when you're on a cruise ship, they don't have a, a, a Wi-Fi antenna. They use a, me a type of mesh network using all the users as part of that system. So if you text somebody, it's literally bouncing through all the phones on the cruise ship until it gets to the person it needs to, and then they get the signal. But it's utilizing everybody's phones to create that network. And that's what they want to do with the, the Internet of Things devices to help create that bigger network. Just a thought, you know, before we get into security. So just planting seeds. <clears throat> Swollen battery. Run to the back to the explosive phone. Swollen battery. All right. So make sure you're using an appropriate power charger because on the back of the power chargers, if you have a laptop, look on the back of your power charger. It will tell you on the back of it the number of volts and amps it produces. That is unique to that type of device. If you plug in one that is far above that, you can fry the device you're using or overcharging the battery can cause that battery to swell, which is creating a chemical re reaction that eventually leads to emulation. So it'll catch fire or explode. So if you have one, but a battery swollen, Stop using it. Don't put it in the freezer. It needs to go in for repair at that point. If you can, if it's a laptop and you can disconnect the battery, disconnect the battery and take it in for recycling. Um, ways to prevent this, do not leave it plugged in all the time. More modern laptops, thankfully, have a way that they kind of exercise the battery even though it is plugged in. So it does this like discharge and charging of the batteries over time, which helps with this, but it's not perfect. Older NICAD batteries can build up what's called a battery memory, which if you like, if you remember like the old Dustbusters and things like that, they had the NICAD battery, you take them off, you use them for like 15 seconds and you plug them back in. And then over time, you realize you can only get about 15 seconds worth of use out of a charge. It's because that memory is developed. It's only discharging that amount of electricity before it charges back up. <clears throat> so you want to make sure you're fully draining a battery and then charging it back up. You don't want to keep charging it when it's at like 85%, 90%. Exercise it. Get it down to you know the 20s or it's like low battery, then charge it, let it charge up. Um, try to keep your devices in cool dry environments this is a challenge in florida because we are the exact opposite of that we are hot wet environment um don't ever leave your phone in the car in summer in florida it will not function when you come back or if it does you are extremely lucky um things like that i know you know up in the northern uh, territories when uh, summer hits, it can get pretty bad up there as well. I know the 80s are brutal for you guys. Down here, you know, we get into the triple digits. All right, almost done. I'm just pushing through and then we'll be breaking for lunch. So just a couple minutes. Uh, batteries experiencing shorter life or not holding charge. Turning off some of your services. If you need to um, expand your light, you know, like get your battery to last just a little bit longer. Dim your screens, turn off Bluetooth. You know, they're like shut down anything you're not using. Close any apps that you don't, you're not using. Uh, that will buy you some time until you get to a place where you can charge. You know, shut off yeah, your Bluetooth, shut off your Wi-Fi, because if you shut off your Wi-Fi, it's not going to be searching for a signal all the time. If you're not connected, you're just using your cellular, you know, makes it, it's using less. If you're not using any of the network connections, put it in full airplane mode. Uh, that will get you even further. Um, it just, it, but again, this just buys you uh, time. Now, if you're starting to have issues where it starts dying shortly after a charge, it may be time to replace that battery.
Questions? So, Mr. Kali, I have a, I have a question to ask. Yes, Ogali. I have um, a laptop that I bought like maybe I think two years and uh, at initial time we can charge it and just take the um, the charger off and we can use it for like a couple of hours and we start you know, uh, running down but right now if we are using it we have to be charging it so does that be it's supposed to be a, a battery problem or something? Talking about a laptop? Yes. So right now it only works when you have it plugged in? Yeah, when, like, yeah, when, when we plug it in, like we can't do nothing without not plugging it in. Okay, then so, yeah, that would be a battery issue. Okay. So I have, a, I have an older laptop. They don't really, you know, I haven't been able to find a battery for it. It's like oh. over 20 years old, but it still works perfectly good when I plug it in. <laughs> that is good. <laughs> This one is oh. not that old, just two years, but it's already yeah. having problem. Mm. And then this this one is one we, we use it for very specific things, um, but it works great. Nice, you know, nice. But, but just you know, it has no mobile capabilities. It has to be plugged in. Mm. Thanks. So we, yeah, it just sounds like it needs a battery replacement. I think so. It's still under warranty. They should be able to take care of it for you. Not. Batteries tend not to be too expensive. So. <laughs> I'm going to go try and buy battery phone because it's, it's an HP, so I'm okay. going to try to buy battery. Wasn't it, uh, DW, weren't you saying the, uh, the HP? I, I think with the knowledge you acquire so far, you should be able to do that by yourself. Yep. Probably. I would watch a few videos on it just to be sure. Do you want me to fix it myself? <laughs> Yeah, that's what we're here for, right? I'll try. <laughs> I mean, that's that, that's why we're here. What'd you say? You were you said DW wasn't either what? what were you saying? saying that the HP batteries are easy to fix? I couldn't remember. That was you. That the HP batteries are easy to fix? Yeah. No, I don't no. think so, man. Uh, those are the ones you have to take the bottom off. Okay. Yes. I, yes. I couldn't. I couldn't. It was. I couldn't remember off the top of my head. Uh, oh, Dell is the Dell is the easy guy. Okay. I, but uh, Ogali, look up that exact model of laptop and battery okay. replacement, and you should be able to find a ton of videos on how to do it and just see if okay. it's something you want to attempt. Okay, no problem. I will try. So, yeah, <laughs> do, some, do some research. You might, you might surprise yourself. That is true. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. We haven't gotten to this yet. But these are the six steps of troubleshooting. We do have a whole technical session just on this. Um, we want, you know, you want to know this through and through. This is like essentially setting up your personal methodology for troubleshooting and solving problems. These are the six steps. We want to identify the problem first. Next, establish a theory as to what we think it may be. After that, we're going to test our theory. Next, we're going to plan the fix and then resolve the problem. After that, this is where most people fall short. Even IT you know, specialists I deal with, if I'm calling in, verify the fix has occurred and then take preventative action. Like, is it going to be customer education? Something along those lines. And then finally, document your findings. Document everything that occurred. Again, we're going to do an entire technical session just on this. So that will be coming up, I believe, next week. All right, with that, we come to the end of our technical session. We should now be able to identify some common issues uh, that occur with mobile devices and have a pretty good idea where to start with resolving those issues. Any comments, questions, concerns? Anybody stomach growling? We need a nap. I got you. <laughs>